Good morning and thanks for joining us on The Real Story. I'm Jen Bernstein. Well, the cavalry is here. Vaccine distribution has begun in Connecticut. Our frontline health care workers and our nursing home residents getting the protection they need and beyond deserve. Now the question is, how many people will take it when it becomes available? Our first guest this morning, the CEO and president of Hartford Healthcare, Jeffrey Flax. Thanks so much for doing this. Thank you. All right, so let's talk about the moment when these shipments of the Pfizer vaccine came in. They, that must have been incredible to, to witness and be a part of as, you know, being in the healthcare industry and watching the doctors and nurses who need this battle this for months. Jen, it, w- it was hard for me to eat, really even to describe it. Uh, it was absolutely an extraordinary moment. Uh, I referred to it as the dawn of a new day. You know, for nine months, it was just nine months ago exactly, uh, on, on nearly on March 13th, where we had our first patient. And to imagine nine months later that we could be sitting here seeing our same frontline staff members who took care of that first patient getting that vaccination. Uh, and, and again, showing the courage, being an inspiration for our community, stepping forward and role modeling by getting that vaccine and showing their faith and uh, confidence in the science. It was a historic, historic moment for us to be part of and to witness and unbelievably gratifying. I was I was very taken by the fact that doctors went on in front of cameras and got those vaccines because that's so important. It's walking the walk, as one of your doctors said, and talking the talk and making sure people understand that if we're asking you to get a vaccine, we're going to get one too. Uh, tell me how those doctors, nurses, and frontline healthcare workers are feeling right now. Jen, you know, some of our physicians described it, uh, that it's a comparable feat for this country as putting a man on the moon. I mean, they said to imagine when you think historically that it would take years and years and years for vaccines to be developed, to have a vaccine in nine months be created for a virus that never existed before and to have it be 95 percent effective is an extraordinary accomplishment. Uh, So we had so many people volunteer and people committed to doing this and and to helping uh, communicate and lead within our communities uh, that they're feeling really well. We monitor everyone very closely. Uh, They're feeling so enthused by the opportunity to do this and what it really means, because it's going to protect all of our patients, all of our community, uh, particularly our populations who are most vulnerable. So we really, we just can't get it there fast enough. And that that's what our focus is today. And so far, no side effects or have there been just minor side effects like swelling in the uh, injection area, that kind of thing? Yeah, very rare. So we, we uh, the vast majority of people, we've had about 500 people at this point um, and more coming every day uh, get, get vaccinated. So Um, when we look at it, the vast majority of people without exception uh, have done very well. So what are the vaccination plans moving forward? Uh, You know, how many people do you plan on getting vaccinated within your health care system? And how long do you think that's going to take? So we plan to vaccinate. We have 33,000 people who work at Hartford HealthCare, uh, and we're working through a process to vaccinate everyone uh, within our system. Uh, so we, we are vaccinating now, uh, and we've created qu- quite a, a process and a capability to do so. So we're going to be vaccinating thousands of people a day within our system uh, with the model that we've created. Uh, so really what's critical for us is how fast we can get the vaccine. Um, and then we do have to administer it twice, depending which vaccine people take and at what the interval is. Uh, so it's going to take us probably until uh, the middle of January, possibly till the end of January. Uh, for us to get through the vast majority of our organization. And certainly by the middle of January, the people who work most closely on the front lines uh, of our operation, most where our patients are, will be vaccinated. And if they got the first shot and then they get exposed, which I know that they're exposed every day, they wear the PPE, they, they try to protect themselves. Though, Does it help once you get the first shot? I know you need the second shot to have real, you know, the vaccine really work. But after the first, does it give them some defenses? It does. It does. So there are indications uh, that they start to develop fairly quickly, uh, some protections, which we're very encouraged by. But at the same time, Jen, you know, the vigilance that we will maintain within our facilities uh, around uh, how, to, how to be careful not, not you know, to spread infection, not to expose our patients, not to expose our staff members. Uh, you know, our processes are absolutely critical and we do everything possible uh, to maintain that vigilance. And, and it's one of the ways, Jen, we're going to be better than normal. And there's so many learnings throughout this crisis, um, but a lot of the work that we've put in place around really able to protect using personal protective equipment at levels beyond what we've ever done before in procedures we've put in place on our different 
uh, parts of our hospitals and all across our health system uh, are going to make us really safer when we emerge than we've ever been. How is our PPE supply? Because that was such a big deal, obviously, in the spring. Is, is this still a concern at this point as we're going through this next real wave this winter? Yeah, I'd never want to say it's not a concern, but at the same time, uh, we've built up quite a stockpile here, as all of my peer organizations across Connecticut have, have really worked to do so. Uh, we're, we're, we're just do as we speak. Uh, we're just taking over a new warehouse that we're going to be opening uh, in uh, central Connecticut, a uh, 50,000 square foot warehouse, because we've acquired so much PP, we've completely outgrown uh, our traditional spaces. So for us, uh, there, are, there are certain spaces particular part uh, segments of PPE that at any point in time might be more difficult to get. Uh, but we're working hard to build a very significant inventory. And in some cases, we have up to a year supply at the present use rates. And probably the areas where we have most vulnerability, we might have 80 days or so, you know, in that range. So we're pretty well situated, but we're never comfortable. And we certainly are working hard to acquire as much as we can, uh, particularly in the areas where we, where we know there's um, certain shortages across the world. Does this change your mindset for the future on what you want to have at hand? I mean, this is obviously the current pandemic, COVID-19. There will be at some point in the future another pandemic, we know just history-wise. Does it change the way you think about it? Completely, Jen. Uh, it's interesting because it's one of the areas I keep talking about. We're going to be better than normal. You know, in healthcare, uh, we spent years working towards having just-in-time inventories and trying to measure efficiencies on trying to turn inventory as quickly as we could because that would be you know, the most cost-effective way to manage inventory. Uh, but I just took a 50,000 square foot warehouse uh, in addition to all of our existing warehouse cap uh, capacity uh, because we don't see this going away. We're going we're gonna to maintain up to a year supply at surge levels of all of our critical PPE because we're not going to find ourselves in this position. And, you know, Jen, I hope at a national level, you know, think historically we had reserves in place for oil if our oil supply was ever disrupted. But at the national level, we never had reserves for PPE. And I'm comfortable that, uh, and I know uh, Congressman John Larson, our entire congressional delegation are sponsoring legislation to, to work towards getting a national uh, reserve in place. And we'll never find ourselves in this position again, uh, hopefully, but I could certainly speak to Hartford HealthCare where we're building a very significant on-site reserve and it's we think it's gonna be best practice. No, that's really smart. I, I wanna talk to you about uh, this uh, alternative care facility that you're rebuilding, right? We had one of these in the spring at the Connecticut Convention Center. You're partnering with the state again. You're partnering with the National Guard. It's 600 beds. You're re resurrecting it. Tell Tell us why, uh, you know, is the ICU a problem right now or is it just to make sure you have enough padding as we continue on this? I know I keep talking about the curve, but that's what we're in right now. Sure. First, I have to commend uh, Governor Lamont. Uh, it's the right thing to do. I think it's a smart thing to do. This is about preparedness. Uh, it's about leveraging the resources within the state and specifically the National Guard, who actually works as our partner in setting up this uh, temporary hospital setting uh, at the convention center. Uh, we don't need it today. Uh, and I'm hopeful that we will never need it. But in the event we need it, you don't want to be building it at that moment. You want to have it well set up and prepared. Uh, and we have to install our electronic health record. We have to install our medication distribution systems, uh, all types of smart pump technology, uh, uh, various equipment relative to oxygenization. So this is the right time to set it up while we can do it thoughtfully, planfully. And if in the event we need it, uh, we can very smoothly start using it. So today we don't need it. Uh, we, we've been very fortunate. We have, you know, in our in our systems today, we still have, you know, probably about 70 percent or so of, of what our peak volume was uh, when we look at, at where we were in the spring. Uh, so we haven't gotten to that point yet. And it's a different circumstance, Jen, because today many more patients are not requiring critical care. So in the spring, critical care was the, was really the, the most um, rate limiting factor within the hospitals. And up to this point, uh, proportionally more patients are being cared for in traditional, uh, what we call medical surgical beds, our floor beds. So right now we're able to manage through this. We watch it every day, uh, but we feel much more comfortable. We think it's a very good insurance policy to have in place. And again, I recognize the state who throughout this crisis has been willing to do whatever it takes that uh, to make sure we're as prepared as we can be. And that's really what setting this up is all about. So how full are our ICU beds at this point? You're saying they are not reaching the levels that we saw before. It sounds like we're getting smarter about how to treat these patients. Is that what I'm hearing? 
There's been incredible innovations. I mean, the ingenuity. Uh, I marvel at our physicians, and I marvel at what's happened in medicine. Uh, again, they were they, they were encountering something they'd never seen before, um, in in a, in a brutal situation with this virus. And over a period of time, they've developed you know new medications, uh, new regimens of medication, uh, new ways to manage patients that have has resulted in less requirements for ICUs. So you know across the state, you'll see ranges from ICUs probably from 65 to 70 percent occupied, up to upwards of 90 percent. And each day of the week matters. Some days of the week predictably have higher ICU uh, utilization than others. But all people within all health systems today are watching it carefully. Um, and we're, we're, we can adjust different things that we do within the institutions if necessary. And those decisions get evaluated literally each and every day. We're in this whole new world right now with the vaccine, and that opens the door to a lot of other unknowns. Will the right amount of people uh, decide to get the vaccine, even if it's healthcare workers or just the general population? Uh, you know, if you have COVID, are you supposed to get the vaccine? I know, I think they are encouraging people to still get right. the vaccine. My question as well, and I'm curious about this, is has anybody been hospitalized twice for COVID at this point that you, got, you all know of? Not specifically, not that I'm aware of as it relates to COVID, but we've certainly had people who had COVID who might come back for other purposes. But I do not, I'm not aware of any person, at least in our, that, that, that's presented with an HHC um, who came back f for COVID a second time. Uh, but, but, you know, this vaccine is, is a tremendous accomplishment and we're working closely with the government. We're working very close both at the state and federal level uh, as we work to prioritize and you know, we're pivoting within Hartford Healthcare. I mean, we've been incredibly focused on testing. We've done over 550,000 tests, uh, which has been our primary focus, and that, that will continue to be essential. But now we have to stand up an entire new operation uh, that can allow us to go across the entire state to, to, to deliver safely the vaccine. And that, re that requires a whole new set of processes to do it properly, to do it safely, uh, and, and to have kind of the right support systems in place to ensure that. So uh, this is a great moment, and it's a moment uh, that we've been so anxiously awaiting for, and it's going to take us some months, obviously, as it rolls out across our, our communities as a whole. Yeah, when do you think we can start seeing a difference in those COVID numbers with this vaccine going out now? I know, obviously, there's a lot of factors, but what's your prediction? Well, this time of year, uh, during the holidays, um, you know, it's so critical uh, that, that the vigilance people continue. Uh, because right now, you know, our, the most important thing we can do is social distancing, uh, wearing a mask, hand hygiene, uh, being really responsible around travel uh, in, in social gatherings. That's most critical. You know, the vaccine is going to start to emerge within our communities uh, when we get into, you know, we hope into that late January, February timeframe, March timeframe, and then starts to roll out across our communities. And, you know, there are variables in terms of what its acceptance will be and how, how quickly uh, we can get the vaccine that has to come, you know, through a, a coordinated federal process. So right now it's about vigilance, ensuring vigilance. Uh, and, and then as soon as that vaccine is able to be broadly distributed, we certainly will do so and we'll do it as fast as we possibly can. All right. Appreciate your time, Jeffrey Flack, CEO and President of Hartford Healthcare. Thanks for being on The Real Story.